Hello. Well, we're now in lecture three, and we're going to be dealing with chapters six and seven. This is on metabolism and DNA to proteins. Now, these are important topics, and they are going to help you understand a little bit more also some of the lab operations we're going to do this week, next week, etc. So it's important if you take the time, as always, to review this, and if necessary, review uh, the lectures several times over. You can do that, okay? Um, you should be having with you at this time your lecture notes for lecture three. And of course, as always, when we start off in chapter six, I tell you to review the glimpse of history, because history is a very important part of some of the aspects of microbiology. As a matter of fact, in one story I'm going to tell you later on, uh, it relates to actually the formation of a nation state, which we'll get into in a little bit. When we talk about metabolism, this is the sum total of chemical reaction used for biosynthetic and energy harvesting processes. And you can see this in 6.1. Now, I know you're seeing right now a bunch of glasses of wine. You're kind of wondering, what's this got to do with things? We're going to show you how later on some of the essential chemistry that goes on. Now, we've talked a little bit about this, and we'll probably bring it up later on when we talk about food microbiology. Uh, but... You know, some of the products that are produced by microbes are very surprising. Not only just al alcohol, but uh, some of the other ones that are much more important, like antibiotics and acetone and butanol and all these other things that make uh, what they call feedstock, basic materials for chemistry uh, to make all sorts of other different products. So when you, you go to something like the terms uh, metabolism, you're going to be talking about really two sides of a coin, anabolism and catabolism. So metabolism is made up of all of these, catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is processes, processes that harvest energy released during the disassembly or breakdown of compounds. So in other words, we take glucose and we break it down to synthesize ATP. Our cells do that. So what's the big difference between us and bacteria? A lot. The structures, the enzymes, uh, the cell components that are in involved with that, because they're different enough, are going to be, and this is the theme you're going to hear me say time and time again, those are going to be key points why when you take things like an antibiotic or some other types of drugs, how they don't mess up our metabolism, but they do mess up the pathogenic agent, okay? Remember, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. That's the energy currency of the cell. When we talk about anabolism, that's biosynthesis. So in other words, this is the processes that use energy stored in ATP to synthesize, assemble subunits of macromolecules making up the cell. Now, if you get confused with macromolecules, go back over Chapter 2. But basically, what are the building blocks of proteins? Amino acids. What are the building blocks of polysaccharides? Monosaccharides and disaccharides. Okay, fine. So when you talk about making cellulose or whether you're talking about making starch, you start off with the basic building block, which would be glucose. This is an example. Usually the ATP generated during the catabolism is eventually used in anabolism. Okay? Understanding bacterial metabolism is very important for many different reasons, and I gave you a couple of them. Because a lot of the bacterial products are commercially or medically important. By the way, you can go to certain parts of the world, uh, certain areas that are very strong with fermentation technologies, uh, biotech technologies, uh, and they make all sorts of things. Everything from citric acid and malic acid and ascorbic acid, yeah, that's vitamin C, to antibiotics and colostridium acetobutylithium, butylithium, yeah, that's a mouthful, that makes acetone and butanol, and those are the basic compounds, that, uh, basic building blocks, feedstocks, that you would make much more complex material, like cordite and other types of explosives, etc. We'll get into that in a bit. Bacterial products are also used as identification markers to classify specific groups of organisms. Now, this is partly where you're going to get into identification of unknown uh, microbes in the lab part. In other words, instead of doing all of the clinical chemistry, understanding the basics of the clinical chemistry is vastly more important. And so when you have an unknown bacteria, if it produces a certain compound, a certain amino acid, a certain um, metabolite, and you have the chemistry necessary to indicate its presence, 
bang, you got yourself a test for that particular compound. Whether it's breaking down, um, for example, fructose as opposed to glucose, or whether it's uh, breaking down certain uh, amino acids, all of these can, can give you certain indications. Whether it's building up lots of acid in the solution, that can give you a different indication if you've got the right indicator to say presence of uh, the pH is dropping. Okay? Now, by the way, bacterial metabolic pathways can serve as a model for studying eukaryotic cell metabolism. And unique metabolic processes in bacteria are potential targets for antimicrobial drugs. Gee, I told you that before. But that's okay. We're going to continue. Let's talk about some of the basic principles of metabolism. Why am I looking at a dam here? Well, let's get through some of the basics of the terminologies. Remember that energy is defined as the capacity to do work. I remember teaching this in AP1. And when you talk about that, you have lots of water held behind a dam, and you notice how it's pouring out those small sluice gates there, or actually those, those uh, tunnels there. That's where it's going to be turbing, uh, turning turbines and producing electric power. Wow. So energy is the capacity to do work. Stored energy is called potential energy. Energy in motion is kinetic energy. So kinetic energy, the example here is that water pouring out from those sluice gates. The potential energy is all the water behind the dam. Now, we're going to have to get used to some really important terminologies here. We're going to talk about reactants, which are the starting pounds, uh, compounds in a chemical reaction, and products. These are the compounds produced from the chemical reaction. So therefore, reactants undergo chemical reaction leading to the formation of products. If you've got your notes there, you see how I did set this up. Uh, in the first law of thermodynamics, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can be changed from one form to another. In other words, there's no magic. Everybody would go, wow, suddenly just something appeared. <laughs> no, didn't happen. First law of thermodynamics would be violated. Think about it this way. We convert the chemical compounds in uh, the chemical bonds in gasoline, break them, and use them for energy to move a car down the street. It can be changed from one form to another. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, that's true. The energy that you get from the sunlight by photosynthesis is converted into stored chemical food energy. The chemical food energy, the organic compounds, are then used for energy to have that little mouse feed itself and then produce muscle energy and all sorts of other cellular energy. Now, we talk about endergonic and exergonic reactions. Endergonic are chemical reactions that require a net input of energy because the products have more free energy than the standing or starting compounds. What does that mean? Think about it this way. You have brownie mix. You pour it into a container. Is it brownies? Nope. You got to put heat energy into it to undergo certain chemical reactions. And at, you know, 350 for 20 minutes, let's say, in your oven. And there you have it. Brownies. Those brownies will, in essence, have a net input of energy. So the brownies have more uh, energy in them than what you started with. An exergonic reaction are chemical reactions that release energy because the starting compounds have more free energy than the products in the chemical than the products of the chemical reaction. What I'm basically saying there is, as a certain chemical reaction is occurring, you get this whoosh, this release of energy. Maybe not a whoosh, maybe a small, you know, glimmer, but you do have that. Simple case in point. I take. A glow tube, if you're familiar with that, you know, the, uh, those chemical luminescent tubes that you break the, the glass vial inside, the plastic contained tube of liquid, and you mix the two solutions together and they give off light. Now, light is a form of energy. The two separate compounds, when they're brought together, have a higher amount of potential energy, and then they have an exergonic reaction. They release energy in this form of light. At the end, the end of those, that chemical reaction, they have less energy present. Now, energy from a reaction can be released all at once or in a series of steps. That's why you don't have huge bangs when you consume any of your food. 
your cells take it out in sl small extracted steps. And we're going to go through this as time goes on. Now, photosynthetic energy is light energy that's used to synthesize organic compounds. Chemoorganotrophs obtain energy by degrading organic compounds. So that mouse might be considered, in a way, but we're not talking about micro, we're talking about uh, a eukaryotic organism here, not a microorganism. But, you know, in a way, you could sit there and say, well, that mouse is sort of a chemoorganotroph. Why? He has to consume organic compounds, in this case, wheat grains, uh, and he degrades it, and that's how he gets his energy. Yeah. Or they might call him a heterotroph, meaning that he eats all sorts of different things to get uh, energy by breaking down the organic compounds. Okay, fine. Now, by the way, there is a nice set on uh, uh, basically 138 that I encourage you to go over those key terms. Now, energy pathways. One of the things we're going to be getting introduced to in this course and in this particular section is certain enzyme pathways. Now, what they're going to do is, we know that an enzyme is a protein-based biological catalyst. Right. Enzymes reduce the activation required for the chemical reaction to occur. So what you have to look at is, if you look at this listing here, where the arrows are, or where you would have enzymes doing certain reactions, and they will take a substrate, which is the reactant in an enzyme reaction, and we'll convert it to a product. Now, product is produced as a result of an enzyme reaction. So if you start at the very top listing, so you, where it says A, a linear metabolic pathway, the starting compound is the substrate. The intermediate A is the product. But wait a minute. The product can also be a substrate for the next reaction. So intermediate A is, in essence, the substrate for the conversion to intermediate B. Intermediate B is now a product, but it's also a substrate for the conversion to end product. Now, that's a linear metabolic pathway. Metabolic pathways are metabolic processes that occur as a, as a series of sequential chemical steps or chemical processes. You've got to have all of the enzymes present so you can do conversion from A to B to C to D to E, etc., the products may influence the enzyme activity of previous steps to help control the production of the pathway. What do I mean by that? Well, if you don't have an enzyme at a particular step, you're going to get a buildup before that step, and you're going to get an absence after that step. Look at the branched metabolic pathway. You have a starting compound, you go to an intermediate A. Now, it could be either B1 or B2, depending on whether or not you have both enzymes present, or only one enzyme present. And then eventually, whatever you have for the intermediate gets converted to the end product. Now, if you look at the cyclic metabolic pathway, and we're going to be seeing a bunch of cycles, I'll tell you today. The starting compound goes into this cycle, and each one of those arrows would be an enzyme. An enzyme converts starting compound to intermediate A, Another one converts its intermediate B. Another one converts to intermediate C. And some of the intermediate C is used as the end product. Some gets converted by another enzyme to intermediate D. And this goes all the way back to intermediate A. By definition, intermediates are products that will be substances for the next step of the pathway. The end product is the final product at the end of the metabolic pathway. And as you can see, pathways can be either linear branched, or cyclical. Now, keep in mind that we have a compound that is extremely important in all of our reactions that we're going to be talking about. And that happens to be ATP. When you look at ATP, that is one of the most important compounds. ATP can be broken down to ADP, which would be adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates, and PI. PI is inorganic phosphate. It is the hydrolyzing of the high-energy phosphate bond between basically the phosphate 2 and phosphate 3 that releases the energy for the cell. In essence, that's an exorganic reaction. Oh, and this chart I have up here, this is just to remind you, remember we talked about this, how enzymes will drop the activation energy so that you can go from energy of reactants to energy of products. Without them, it would take a much higher amount of energy. Okay?
Here's the ATP issue that I was talking with you about. Now look, several cellular processes can be used to make ATP. And basically what you have is a nice system where you take ADP and PI, which is endergonic, and you put it together. Endergonic means you have to put some energy in. So to, to recycle ADP and PI, you're going to have to put energy into the system. That's usually in one of the processes to, for our cells that we break down uh, foods to basically remake more ATP. The ATP is then used by different cell processes, getting the energy once they snap off the final P, uh, that is the phosphate. Okay? The two major forms, or actually three, is substrate level phosphorylation, and that uses chemical energy to add PI to ADP. Oxidative phosphorylation, which uses energy from the proton motor force to add PI to ADP. That's a process that you see very commonly in mitochondria. And photophosphorylation. Now, that's a process that uses light energy to drive the formation of the proton motor force. We're going to talk more about that when we touch upon photosynthesis. When we talk about an energy source, this is a compound broken down by a cell to release energy. Okay. And we've got to get used to a couple of other little terms here. It's important to get kind of a background here first before we get moving into all of the different cellular uh, metabolic processes and biochemical processes. Oxidative reductive reactions, it's also known as redox reactions. Very easy for some people to sit there and go, is it like rust? Well, that's one type of an oxidative reductive reaction, but you have to get a little bit removed from the rust concept to understand something here. It's a movement of electrons, who gets it and who loses it. A chemical reaction where one or more electrons are transferred from one substance to another. These are redox reactions. The compound that loses the electrons is said to be oxidized. Now it doesn't mean it adds on oxygen, it just loses an electron. The compound that gains those electrons is said to be reduced. Now some compounds can lose not only electrons but protons. So, they would lose hydrogen ions. Thus, the compound that loses a hydrogen is oxidized, and the compound that gains the hydrogen is reduced. Metabolic processes remove hydrogens or electrons or both, and you need to be aware of that. Compounds that lose electrons, the electron donor, undergo dehydrogenation, whereas a compound that receives electrons, it's the electron acceptor, it'll undergo hydrogenation. A carrier can be considered a hydrogen carrier if a hydrogen proton accompanies the electron. We're going to see how that sometimes occurs. Electron carriers. Well, let me show you something here. Now, you see how these are simple situation. Compound A becomes oxidized. It loses an electron. Compound B gains an electron. It is said to be reduced. Now, you see this listing here. For figure 6.7. Don't lose a lot of sleep on this one. This is to give you some understanding. Because what happens in a lot of the biological systems with organic compounds is they will have a release of energy and there will be some type of compound or some type of chemical that will accept that electron, whether it's carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide or iron, etc., or nitrate or nitrite uh, to form ammonia. Some of the more unique or uh, by microorganisms will deal with this, but we're not going to be dealing with them a lot when it comes to um, the actual pathogens, so don't lose a lot of sleep on that. Glucose uses an energy source, has as its terminal electron acceptor either pyruvate or oxygen or nitrates, okay? But let's focus on the electron carriers that we really need to know about. And those are designated molecules that will carry the electron. Uh, they participate in reactions that oxidize the energy source. These are the ones that you're going to be seeing, seeing a lot when we start talking about um, uh, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, etc. They are these very unique little uh, molecules that take on certain things. Notice they're going to be taking on either protons or elect well, actually protons and electrons. 
NAD plus is nicotinamid adenine, adenine dinucleotide. It's a mouthful. It becomes NADH. Flavine adenine dinucleotide, FAD, becomes FADH2. So it takes up two protons, two electrons. NADP plus is nicotinamide adenine, adenine dinucleotide phosphate. And it becomes NADPH. You will see this a lot when we start dealing with uh, biochemical compounds. You'll also see these listed on page 143. And you'll see them also on table 6.1. Okay? This is considered to represent what we call reducing power. Since their bond contains usable energy, which will drive the reactions for oxidative phosphorylation that eventually produces a lot more ATP, which you'll see this in a while. Okay? Now, precursor metabolites, we're going to have to deal with those just for a second. One thing I encourage students not to do is sit there and just memorize this entire list. Okay? You're going to drive yourself crazy. And I really don't want crazy students. Yes, have a smile there because I'm going to show you where this is going to apply to. But this is sort of a general introduction to this. You take a look at that. And you take a look also at figure 6.9. You'll probably have a little bit better handle on things. Okay, sorry about the break. Anyways, so what you have to understand is this. Remember we talked about intermediates in an enzyme um, pathway? You're going to be dealing with a lot of metabolic intermediates. They are produced at specific steps during a catabolic pathway. They can be used by also anabolic pathways too. So they can be shunted over from one side to the other. And the shunting can be necessary for taking these compounds and then converting them into amino acids, fatty acids, etc. Okay? What you're going to see though is that there are some organisms that can live on very, very simple materials. So they have the capability to shunt off these select compounds to make the basic built biological building blocks. E. coli can live on simple salts and glucose. Glucose is the carbon source. The simple salts would provide the necessary basic building blocks and boom, it'll make all the amino acids it needs, fatty acids, uh, whatever it needs in the sense of carbohydrates, etc. by just siphoning off the precursors from its catabolic process. Now, there is, there is a cost for this and that reduces the energy yield for the catabolic processes, but it works out wonderfully if you're a, if you're a cell that can work on the basic minimum, okay? As you can see here, here we have glucose molecules. Some of them are being uh, broken down and some of them are being shunted over for amino acid synthesis, nucleic acid synthesis, carbohydrate synthesis, lipid synthesis, whereas some of them are just being converted to CO2 and energy. Now we're going to be dealing with a lot of these steps in the next few minutes. If you take a look at figure 610, you go, oh my goodness. Well, we're not asking you to memorize all of the necessary steps inside of each one of those blocks. Just get some of the basic pointers down because what you have to understand is this. In biological cells, it is some of the, the neatest pharmacological approaches that interfere with some of these processes that will provide for you antibiotics and other compounds that are necessary to stop microorganisms, stop them in their different pathways, or some of these pathways we may provide the means to identify them. Okay. So the scheme of metabolism is that the, the metabolic pathways used will gradually oxidize glucose. Remember we talked about how energy can be released when Big Bang or in small little bursts. The small little bursts are being tapped into as we oxidize glucose completely to carbon dioxide. The three primary steps of the central metabolic pathways are glycolysis, the pentose phosphate pathway, and the tricarboxylic acid cycle. If you had biology, you might have also learned it as the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle. 
Now we'll get into the electron transport chain later. Don't panic. But these key pathways provide cells with ATP, with reducing power in the sense that it will basically uh, make NADH, FADH, etc., as well as precursor metabolites. And keep in mind that the pathways have dual roles. They are thus considered amphibolic pathways. That is, they can act as an anabolic or a catabolic. Most of the time, they're considered catabolic. So let's talk a little bit more about these. First off, glycolysis. Glycolysis, otherwise known as the glycolytic pathway. If you had any basic uh, biology, you probably heard about this. How does my cell start off breaking down glucose in the cell? It all occurs in the cytoplasm. Well, if you're bacteria, all you got really is cytoplasm. You don't have any nucleus. You don't have any uh, membrane-bound organelles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glycolysis is a multi-step pathway. It breaks down the seven carbon sugar, that is glucose, to two uh, three-carbon compounds. The three-carbon compound is pyruvate. So in other words, take six carbon chain, break it in half, and we've got two three-carbon molecules. It also ends up giving you a little bit of ATP. You get two ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. Now, what about the pentose phosphate pathway? Initiates the breakdown of glucose, but is a sidestep that's primarily involved in the production of precursor metabolites and also making NADH. A transition step will occur, because what do you do with the pyruvate? The pyruvate gets converted to a two-carbon molecule, acetate. It joins with a coenzyme called CoA. This is acetyl-CoA that you're forming. One of the carbons is removed. Therefore, 3 minus 2 is 1. What do we do with the carbon? We make it into carbon dioxide. Thus, acetyl-CoA is formed, and the product is transferred to the TCA cycle. Ah, Krebs cycle. I remember it so well. No, not really. The TCA cycle will take acetyl-CoA, and in a series of steps, breaks the carbons of the acetyl group down. You end up with, well, you had a two-carbon molecule. You're going to get it with two molecules of carbon dioxide. And in that same process, as you're going round and round, you're going to produce more reducing power molecules and ATP. Now, that's pretty cool when you think about it. Respiration. Organisms that use respiration are said to respire. What's that mean? It uses the reducing power accumulated by the electron acceptors previously discussed, made by the previous steps of the central metabolic pathways, and synthesizes ATP via oxidative phosphorylation. Yeah, you're reading it. What does it mean? You're going to get energy. It's going to be derived to undertake the process. And what you're going to do is it's all going to get pumped over to that um, electron transport chain. It's facilitated by the proton motor force. And this is developed by the reducing power molecules pumping hydrogens outside of the cell membrane. Remember we talked about NADH, uh, NADPH. Everything had H on it. It had hydrogens on it. The reason is you're going to pump those hydrogens out. And they're going to be your little dam, which I'm going to show you in a little bit at the uh, electron transport chain, how they're going to start running an enzyme that's going to take and make a lot more ATP. Now. Respiration methods depend on the terminal electron acceptor. Most of the time I've been using examples of that involve oxygen for the terminal electron acceptor, and we make water, but that doesn't always work with certain uh, bacteria. The aerobic respiration, aerobic oxygen, think of that, okay, uses oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor, and that basically forms the molecule water. Yeah, I said that. Anaerobic respiration, anaerobic, non-air. A-N in front of it means nope, nope. So it's no aerobic. Uses another molecule as a terminal electron acceptor. Usually it's an inorganic molecule. It could be nitrate. It could be iron. We're, we're going to go into that. And then we got this other really interesting system. Fermentation. Hey, fermentation, like making wine. Well, sort of. Cells that cannot respire must recycle their reduced electron carrier. So the reduced electron carrier pyruvate, what are you going to do with that? So fermentation only uses part of the glucose molecule. So really what you're saying is, I got this glucose molecule and I get a couple of ATPs and then the rest of it is wasted as pyruvate. 
Well, yeah. But a lot of cells, what they'll do is they'll take the pyruvate and do something else. Pyruvate, pyruvate or a derivative, takes the electrons from the reducing power electron acceptors, and the molecule is converted to some other type of molecule. All right? So here's a nice table 6.3, and it tells us a nice little breakdown here. Who's the terminal electron acceptor? Does it use an electron transport chain? Anaerobic and aerobic can. Fermentation does not. The ATP generated by oxidative phosphorylation, what's the theoretical maximum? Uh, I just want to give you a heads up about this. A lot of people, when they took biology, maybe in high school, maybe in college, they might have remembered, oh, yeah, when I break down gly uh, glucose, I get 36 ATP. Biochemists are now kind of hinging on that, cringing on it, saying, well, it might be 34, it might be 32. Total generated maximum, if you go through glycolysis, through the T TCA cycle, in the electron transport chain, in a eukaryotic life form, could be 36, could be as high as 30, 38. But you're going to see that in a bit. Fermentation, forget it. You're stuck with just two. And you get pyruvate, which can be converted into other materials in a bit. Okay. By the way, there's a nice micro-assessment. You should be taking time to review it. Now, also review the case presentation. But let us move forward here. First, we're going to step back a minute and go through enzymes a little bit more in detail. Enzymes are protein-based uh, catalysts. We've talked about this. Remember that enzymes can flex because they are big, long chains of amino acids set into a three-dimensional space arrangement. They will have a site on it called the active site. And this is where the substrate binds to it and the chemical reaction occurs. Now there's a theory that goes around called the induced fit theory. And basically it says that the active site flexes around the substrate. This increases the binding and the chemical action of the enzyme on the substrate. There's some very important things here about enzymes that you need to grasp onto now. This is going to help you with pharmacology. This is going to help you later when we talk about antibiotics and other drug treatments for various microbiological pathogens. So hang in there. When we talk about enzymes, you've got to keep in mind that they're substrate specific, meaning that they fit like a lock and a key, but also meaning this, that they're very, very specific for one particular chemical reaction. I have two charts that if I put them up in a classroom, they would probably fill the entire length of the wall. There are 10,000 plus different chemical uh, reactions that go on inside of a cell, and hence there are about 10,000 different names or enzymes that go and account for each one of these reactions. So usually an enzyme is very specific. It'll do one, maybe tops two reactions, and that's it. And that's why there's thousands of them, because we have thousands of different chemical reactions occurring. Now, cofactor. Cofactor is a non-protein component. It'll assist the enzyme in its activity. These may vary. They may include metal ions. Organic molecules uh, are called coenzymes. The coenzymes may be chemically altered. The enzymes are never. But the coenzymes might be during the chemical reaction. Many coenzymes either donate a proton, electron, or other chemical functional group. Many coenzymes are derived from vitamins, okay? And if you take a look at 6.4, you'll see this, all right? You can see a lot of those vitamins. Hey, niacin, riboflavin, folic acid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, 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 very important. Also keep in mind that enzymes can be affected by temperature, pH, ion concentrations, etc. Okay? So you want to keep these factors in mind as you're going back through this. Uh, some of this is very straightforward. And what do I mean by that? If you think about it, if proteins are made, if enzymes are made of proteins, proteins can be denatured if you go high enough in a temperature or if you have an abnormal pH. So if you unravel the enzyme, unravel the protein of it, you're going to eventually get a point where you're going to have no enzymatic activity. If you denature the enzyme, it loses its capability. And you can see as the temperature went up there, you have the optimal temperature, and then beyond that, it loses it 
because obviously as it unravels the act of sight becomes unavailable and you can't do the chemical reactions. You see the same thing for acidity. Okay. Now a couple things to keep in mind. Regulation. Allosteric enzymes. These are enzymes with a site, other than the active site, which can alter or control the activity of the enzyme. If you take a look at this diagram here, there is the active site where the substrate binds, and then there's this allosteric site. If you have a right compound and it binds into that allosteric site, it twists or, or warps or deconforms uh, the shape of the enzyme such that the active site becomes unavailable. Now, this can happen also in a regulatory pathway. In other words, your end product can affect a particular enzyme upstream and thereby shut down uh, the entire enzyme pathway. And this is a type of situation we call feedback inhibition. So in other words, if you have too much of the end product, the end product's uh, surplus will act to inhibit enzyme A which stops the entire process until the end product reduces in its concentration and is required again and therefore um, the end product will pop off of the allosteric site the entire enzyme pathway will be active again and then you will start making more of the end product I hope that helps now enzyme inhibition is also important and I bring this up if you take a look at some of the characteristics of enzyme inhibitors and this is really important because this is also going to go and be involved with some of the uh, aspects of pharmacology, for example. Now, you have the competitive inhibition, you have the non-competitive inhibition, and basically you have non-competitive inhibition by enzyme poisons, which we'll get into in a second, but a competitive inhibitor is basically at that active site. The active site is blocked and this is because the compound will actually sit on the active site, it'll block it. Uh, the compound, the inhibitor, competes for access to the active site against the substrate. One example of this is sulfanamide, otherwise known as a, a sulfa drug. It blocks the vitamin PABA from being converted to folic acid. And this is how sulfa drugs, in certain cases, will kill bacteria cells. Okay, The non-competitive inhibitor is usually a compound that binds to the allosteric site on the enzyme. And when it does this, it will flex the enzyme out of configuration. The active site will be distorted and rendered useless. And therefore, the enzyme is now rendered inactive. Okay? Now, a non competitive inhibitor that is a regulatory molecule controls the enzyme activity. This is basically a temporary uh, process. In other words, works until the regulatory molecules drop in their concentration and then the enzymes active again. With an enzyme poison, the compound permanently changes the enzyme, rendering the enzyme permanently non-functional. Example, mercury compounds. Why mercury was so bad? Well, everybody talks about mercury. It was in, you know, thermometers and it was in fluorescent tubes and, uh, yes, fluorescent bulbs, etc. And so everybody started getting very concerned about this because mercury compounds, even at small amounts, can act on the sulf, uh, the uh, sulf hydro bonds that exist in certain enzymes. They block it and therefore block the formation of disulfide bonds and therefore you have the loss of the tertiary structure of the enzyme, in other words, that three-dimensional structure, and therefore renders the enzyme permanently inactive. Okay, And by the way, that's not unusual. Lead does this, and there are several other compounds. That's why we stopped making lead-based paint. Because what lead would do is the lead acetate or lead compounds in the paint would help inhibit molds and other types of materials that would break down the paint. The problem is the paint, whether you scrape it off or, or, or sand it off, is still toxic. Okay? All right. And you can see the sulfanamide example right here. And you can see this in another example here. Basically, what you've got is PAB is the substrate, sulfa is the inhibitor, and therefore PABA doesn't get converted. 
Okay, and you notice the structural similarities here between, between salt enolamide and PABA. Okay, now we're going to start going a little bit more into the central metabolic pathways. And I'm going to again warn you, you do not need to memorize all the little steps that you're going to see in figure 616, 617. I'm going to show you those in a few minutes. I want you to get the basics, and what the basics are, are in my notes, okay? And I, and I say this with, with trying to assure students, because even when I was taking biochemistry, whether it was graduate or undergraduate, everybody would be going bananas over this, going, do I got to memorize this? And actually, there were some professors uh, that would say, yeah, you got to memorize every step. Here, you do not. Get the major point, glycolysis. It's going to generate two ATP, you're going to get two NADH and two hydrogen ions. You're going to get six different precursor metabolites possibly generated. Let's go over it. What you see here is the steps. You start up at the top with glucose, which is a six carbon sugar, and it gets phosphorylated, so it stays inside the cells. And then what happens is you start adding phosphates to it. It gets broken from a six carbon molecule to a three carbon. So you have now two three carbon molecules going down through the steps, and what do you end up with? Pyruvate and a couple of ATPs, right? It's a 10 step pathway. And if you can see that in the steps, and if you can remember that, you're doing great. The end product is pyruvate. Pyruvate. Well, before we get into that, we want to just get into the pentose phosphate pathway. It's sort of a side uh, show, and basically what it does is it generates three carbon, five carbon, and seven carbon sugars for biosynthesis. It can operate in the presence or absence of oxygen, produces NADPH for reducing power, as well as rib ribose 5-phosphate, erythrose 4-phosphate intermediates, which are precursor metabolites. In other words, the building blocks for other things. Let's get back to pyruvate. Okay, back to pyruvate. Every process except for respiration takes place in the cytoplasm of the prokaryotes. Everybody got that? Good. Transition step will produce NADH, convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is also a precursor metabolite. In other words, I can take, uh, tap off acetyl-CoAs and link them all together and make some nice fatty acids if I've got to add on construction for my cell membrane. Pyruvate, pyruvate can be converted during fermentation to other molecules, which we're going to talk about later. Now, we get through the TCA cycle. Got to go back here for a second. You have eight-step process that converts acetyl-CoA compound. You go through it twice. You end up with two molecules of carbon dioxide. You get ATP, three molecules of NADH, and one molecule of FADH2. Each step requires a specific enzyme to facilitate the reaction. Remember I said, you don't have to memorize all those things. Succinyl, CoA, succinate, fumarate, malate, no, 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 no. Don't worry about that. You also get two intermediate products. That's the basics in my notes. That's what I want you to know. Now. After we get done with all of this, what do we do with the FADH2, the NADH? How do we get more ATPs? How do we get more bang for our buck? Remember that we said that we can tap off energy in a variety of steps. What we're going to find is we're going to have higher energy electrons that are going to be present, and what we're going to do is have them go through a series of steps, and smaller steps, just like a slinky. Bring, 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 bring. If you've ever seen a slinky, that big uh, toy. Every time you drop a step, you're going to release energy, and that's going to be used to generate proton motive force. We're going to explain that in a second. And in the vinyl end, what do you do with the electrons after they've lost so much energy? They're going to basically connect with oxygen, with the hydrogen ions, and form a molecule of water. This is where we get into the cellular respiration process. And if you turn to 157, you're going to see that slinky arrangement. The basics are, this is similar to what you've seen in a eukaryotic cell, in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. What is it? 
It uses oxidative phosphorylation via ATP synthase. If you look on the far right there, you can see that very complex little molecule, uh, that protein system, and it's going to basically take, as hydrogens run through it, it's going to take that energy of hydrogens going from the outside to the inside. And it's going to each time take ADP and PI and make ATP. Okay? The ATP synthase for bacteria is embedded in the bacterial cytoplasmic membrane. You're going to make lots and lots and lots of ATP. And remember, that's energy. The electron transport chain generates the electron motive force to provide the energy for the ATP synthesis. What is this proton motive force you keep talking about? It uses the energy for the synthesis of, in small steps in which the total yield, you get large releases of energy. What happens is notice going from left to right on the bottom part there. NADH, for example, plus H, will give off hydrogens and electrons. As it does, the electrons take complex one and cause it to pump hydrogens outside. The electrons continue to pass downward, and what happens is complex 3 gets active, and it gets charged to pump hydrogens out. And then the electrons are used again, less energy, but complex 4 will pump out more hydrogens. Okay, that's nice. And what, what happens, you're going to get a lot of, you're going to get a lot of hydrogens pushed outside the membrane. That means the concentration builds up. Also, these are not hydrogens that are neutral. They're really protons, meaning that they're stripped hydrogen atoms, means they are positively charged. So you get lots of positive charge and lots of hydrogen ions on the outside and very little on the inside. And that's known as a, a, a concentration gradient, isn't it? But because these are charged particles, we get what we call uh, the electrochemical gradient otherwise known as the chemiosmotic gradient. You have lots of hydrogen ions pumped outside the membrane, and they're going to be sitting there ready to jump down ATP synthase, because that's going to basically let them run through. And as they run through, it's going to run the entire enzyme matrix. You see this very commonly, if you probably had this in AP1 or AP2, for the mitochondria. Well, guess what? It works also in the bacteria. Okay? Now, you got to keep in mind that there are electron transport chain. There's uh, four different uh, electron carriers that participate in this. Think of them as the bucket brigade. They're going to act to carry electrons from one site to the other. you got flavoproteins, iron sulfur proteins, quinones. Otherwise, uh, one example best known is ubiquinone. And cytochromes. Now, cytochromes will always, there's a bunch of different types, and so they always end with a particular letter, cytochrome A, cytochrome C, etc. Those are ones that are targeted by certain drugs to shut down the entire process. And if they do that, the organism dies. Okay? Energy from the electrons is released in steps. The complex are grouped together to, re to receive an electron pump a hydrogen ion outside the membrane. Okay, so there are differences in cytochromes I talked about. And they help to distinguish the different types of species. That's how much they're different. You have an oxidase test, which is uh, to determine activity of cytochrome C. This is used to identify species of Pseudomonas and Campylobacter. You also have to keep in mind that the proton motor force can be used for other activities beyond just ATP synthesis. It's used for the active transport and 1,200 hydrogen ions are needed to generate, generate one rotation of the flagella. Okay? And you can see the flagella on the far end there. So basically, you've got hydrogen uh, power there, the proton motor force, that can make ATPs. You can do this for active transport, transporting a molecule from low concentration to the inside of the cell for high concentration, going up against the concentration gradient, but still being able to do it or rotating your flagella, okay? Now, E. coli has different components of the electron transport chain that work depending on the availability of oxygen. Also, anaerobic respiration. With anaerobes 
they can use nitrates as the terminal electron acceptor, converting nitrate to nitrite. So instead of oxygen being the terminal electron acceptor, forming water, you're going to have a different compound. What about sulfur-reducing bacteria? They use sulfates as the terminal electron acceptor, reduce sulfates to hydrogen sulfide. So if you're ever going through an area where there's a lot of hydrogen sulfide in mucks or muddy areas or foul garbage or stuff like that, places where there's not oxygen, but you can definitely smell a rotten egg smell, that's probably because you've got some sulfur-reducing bacteria playing a role. Okay, so let's talk also about... ATP production. And what you see here is this. ATP synthase produces ATP. But as I said, this depends on optimal conditions as to the exact amount. It also depends on the presence of the reducing power compounds. You see, not all of them are made equally. NADH will yield three ATPs. FADH2 yields two ATPs in the best conditions one molecule of glucose da -da, gets down and made. It'll yield about 38 ATP. Am I going to test you on absolutely all the little numbers? No. But you better start thinking about this. Because it's also going to play a key role in some of the differences that you see. How some cells will tap in and get lots of energy. And they need that energy because they're going to be doing a lot of things. Remember, just how many... How many uh, ATPs are going to be necessary just to flip around uh, one flagella or to do certain complex chemistry. It's going to be a lot, and you're going to need it. Okay, from here, we're moving out, and we're going into fermentation. Yes, I know, everybody's sitting there perking up going, yeah, beer, yeah, wine. Well, what about bread? What about bread, huh? Bread? Yeah, we'll get into that. What you have to keep in mind is this. Fermentation is a process that is used by cells that don't respire. One, you have lactic acid bacteria. These are aerotolerant anaerobes. What this means is, you know, some are considered obligate fermenters. Aerotolerant means, yeah, I can deal with oxygen being present, but, I'd ra but I can easily function without it. Okay? But they don't have the capability really to use the oxygen. What do they do? They convert pyruvate to lactic acid, in the, to lactate in ionized form. Various cells that ferment must recycle the reduced coenzymes. They've got to get rid of those electrons and the hydrogen ions. And usually they do this by, by making pyruvate, or a modified molecule pyruvate, the terminal electron acceptor. And everybody can see that. Now, keep in mind, what are you seeing there? In the lower part there, ethanol fermentation, you start off with pyruvate, you make it into acetaldehyde, it picks up another hydrogen, and what do you have? Ethanol. Oh, and by the way, there are a lot of different strategies for a lot of different microorganisms. What do I mean by that? Various organisms use various processes of ferment fermentation. And this is very useful for identification of the organism. Lactic acid, you have lactic acid bacteria. They're gram-positive, they're useful in food production to make yogurt, cheese, pickles, but they also can lead to tooth decay. Ethanol. Pyruvate has one molecule of carbon dioxide removed, and then the acetaldehyde is reduced to ethyl alcohol. So you've got zymomonas, which are bacteria, they use that pathway. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, brewer's yeast, baker's yeast, they do the same thing. Oh, and yeah, by the way, when I talked about bread, and I'm just giving you a little heads up. When you get into food microbiology later on, we'll be talking about it a little bit more. If you've ever really, really made bread yourself, you'll notice it's kind of like an ethanol smell. And that's when the bread is basically going through the rising process. It's building up the carbon dioxide, but it also has some ethanol in it. And to stop the entire rising process, you cook it. You heat it up. You bake the bread. And that's when the ethanol goes, whoosh, gone, with some of the carbon dioxide. That is why some bakeries and some massive bread producing factories actually got shut down in the 80s going into the 90s. Because they were producing so much ethanol, they couldn't recover it. And it, uh, some of the anti-pollution laws were considering a greenhouse gas or something like that. So they stopped. And I used to drive through Worcester at times, getting that fresh baked bread smell from the factory, and then they stopped it. 
And they usually got it about 9.30 at night when they were making it. It was really cool. But let's talk about some other compounds. In colostridium, we have butyric acid. And this is a multi-level process, but this is useful to make butanol and acetone. Okay, I want to finish up and give you a little story. But propionic acid, a multi-level process, requires carbon dioxide removed from pyruvate. And propionium bacterium use the process. This is where you get great Swiss cheese. And it's interesting, you know what makes the holes up? Carbon dioxide buildup. 2,3-butanediol is a multi-step process. It strips away two carbon dioxide molecules to generate acetonin, which is later made into butanediol. You get the volks proskauser test, which detects the acetonin. Now, enterobacteria family members can be distinguished by this test. So this is something that you'd see as not a test, and you'll see this over on the far right. Okay, now, let me give you a real quick story. Um, World War I was coming up, and Britain was in a, a serious problem. Um, they couldn't get freely from petroleum because they were under German U-boat, um, sort of a, basically, uh, there was a blockade occurring. And so Great Britain was under real stress. What do they do to make the, the feedstocks, to make the explosives necessary to fight the war? Chaim Herzog <coughs> was a Jewish Zionist. In other words, he favored the formation of the state of Israel. And at that time, there wasn't a state of Israel. And he had developed the technique of using this particular species, Clostridium, and he could make large amounts of, basically you grow the, the bugs and they eventually make lots and lots of acetone and butanol, which can be used to make cordite and other explosives. And he gave it to the Great Britain, but worked out and negotiated and said, look, we really need a home for the Jews. Now remember, there wasn't a state of Israel then, and this is World War I. And eventually this is what led to the formation of the Balfour Declaration and eventually although we had World War II after that the State of Israel was formed and Herzog was really the first president of the State of Israel. He was a very renowned organic chemist. He got his degree, his PhD in organic chemistry but he's known for also his work in uh, the chemistry that occurs in microbiology. And that is how, in part, a nation state was formed by the very ingenious work done in early microbiology of the uh, early 20th century. And it saved a nation also in the midst of World War I. Small things to think about, huh? Okay, let's talk about catabolism of other organic molecules, shall we? I love telling that story because it's really important. If you take a look at just pyruvate, look at all the different formations you get here. Uh, this is an earlier chart that I thought would be very helpful for some. Just look at E. coli from pyruvate. It'll make acetic acid, lactic acid, succinic acid, ethyl alcohol, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, sarcomyces, ethyl alcohol, colostridium. You've got all of those, including isopropyl alcohol, propionium. Uh, bacterium, propionic acid, acetic acid, and so forth and so on. Now, now, what if you're an organism and you need to tap into some of this to make your amino acids or fatty acids or glycerol or monosaccharides, etc.? Hydrolytic enzymes break down other compounds and they will yield the useful organic compounds. Um, so, in other words, you can. Uh, break down other sources. You know, amylases will break down starches to yield glucose. Cellulases will break down cellulose to yield glucose. Lipases can break down lipids, and, and lipids are broken down further by beta oxidation process to yield acetyl CoA, which can then be pumped into the TCA cycle to get, give you more ATP. Proteases will break down proteins. Everybody clear on that? 
Basically, there are other means, and some of these means will also be used for identification of specific bacteria. Chemolithotropes. Uh, there is an interesting perspective on 6.1, mining with microbes. I just want you to get somewhat familiarized a little bit. I don't expect you to memorize a lot, okay? Just understand that you can, there are microorganisms that use reduced inorganic compounds as their energy source. They'll also use carbon dioxide as the carbon source. A lot of these bacteria will use a terminal electron acceptor other than oxygen. Uh, and these fall into four general groups with respect to their energy source. Hydrogen bacteria, sulfur bacteria, iron bacteria, nitrifying bacteria, and they basically use either ammonia or nitrate. The energy extraction depends on the sources of energy and the terminal electron acceptor. That said, you can see this also on a chart the same way. Okay. Now, let's start getting into something sunny. Sorry, no joke. Photosynthesis. Now, you got to keep in mind photosynthesis is important because you're going to find that several groups of bacteria, plants, algae capture light energy and they use it to synthesize organic compounds. When you think about it, that's really cool. Okay. I mean, a lot of the rest of life is dependent on chewing up, you know, bacteria, plants, or algae to get their organic compounds, whereas bacteria, some bacteria, plants, and algae, they can make it right out from what powers their capability to do this is really sunlight. Now, there's really two uh, reactions that, that is photosynthesis is broken down to. Light dependent reactions which capture the light convert the converted to chemical energy in the form of ATP. Light independent, it's also called dark reactions. They use the ATP to convert carbon dioxide to organic compounds. And then you got to deal with carbon fixation. This is the process used to convert carbon compounds to organic compounds. When you talk about light capture, and light capture in plants, algae, and cyanobacteria, they generate oxygen. Okay, so they're called oxygenic, and they use chlorophylls. In purple and green photosynthetic bacteria, they use bacteria chlorophylls. They don't generate oxygen, so they're considered anoxygenic. Now, there are certain pigments that capture wave lives of energy, okay, aside of the chlorophylls. An example would be carotenoids. This is the stuff that you would see even in your... Uh, uh, the colors that you would see in like orange or yellow that you see in squashes and in carrots. The, but the carotenoids are a little bit different when we talk about algae and plants and in some bacteria. The carotenoids found in both types of bacteria as well as in algae and plants. Uh, you've got phycobilins which are unique to cyanobacteria and red algae. Light is captured in the photosynthesis and it's composed of a reaction center and ante antenna pigments. Think of the antenna as the ones that will also capture some of this energy. Okay? So eventually they hand it over to the reaction center pigments. They're going to generate electrons from the light excitation. Light is also captured, as I said, by the antenna complex. And, and this is composed of accessory pigments and chlorophyll molecules. Okay? And you see this right here. Photosystem 1 and Photosystem system 2. Yes, my tongue is getting numb. I needed a little drink of water, which I'll get afterwards. Every time that light hits one of these molecules, it's going to cause electrons to flow from the chlorophyll molecules. Now, well, wait a minute. If the electrons leave, doesn't that mean something gets positively charged? Well, the electrons will get recharged in a minute. They'll get replaced, I should say. And the high energy electron being released will generate a proton motive force via the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain will ge generate, yep, ATP. Okay? The photosystems. And as you can see, there's two of them that exist, photosystem one, photosystem two. One system, the photosystem two, splits water molecules to generate them, to basically supply the missing electrons. So in other words, it loses the electrons, 
How does it get them back? By splitting water. Okay? The other system gets its replenishment of electrons from photosystem 2. So photosystem 2 is absolutely essential because it's going to basically rebalance the loss of electrons by splitting water molecules. Both systems will generate ATP molecules via what's called photophosphorylation. That was the part I was talking about earlier. Now purple and green bacteria obtain electrons for their replenishment from a reduced compound other than water. Usually they're going to get this from hydrogen gas, hydrogen sulfide, and therefore you're not going to see the generated oxygen. See, remember, if you ever remember uh, your basics of photosynthesis, okay, carbon dioxide and water plus sunlight uh, gives you uh, glucose and oxygen. Okay, fine. But with purple and green bacteria, okay, you're not going to get oxygen generated. You're going to play around with hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen gas, something else. Okay, as long as everybody's clear on that. Now, what about carbon fixation? Carbon fixation, also known as the Calvin cycle. This is the cyclic process that uses the ATP to fix carbon dioxide to make a three carbon molecule. Remember, take two three carbon molecules, put them together, what do you got? Glucose! Yeah, three plus three is six. Okay, now, here's the key. I want you just to understand one enzyme. It's called Rubisco. The process of carbon fixation consumes a great deal of energy. One molecule of glucose requires 18 ATP molecules, which kind of makes you kind of appreciate what's going on there. In your average plant, wow, they do all this. They take carbon dioxide in, and they patch it all together, and they take a certain amount of ATP, some of it's supplied by NADPH or some other system, and what happens? You end up making glucose. Okay? That's what I wanted you to gather. You don't have to be a massive biochemist. What I do want you to start thinking about is, okay, um, what about the anabolic, anabolic pathways? What about building up? Okay? Prokaryotes have got to synthesize many compounds from precursor metabolites. One way to think about it is this. You and I would go out, we'd get our protein from, let's say, steak or beans and rice. Uh, we could get our glucose from sugar or starches or anything else. But bacteria don't have it that easy. A lot of prokaryotes don't. They have to basically build it up from small carbon molecules and add on things and make their amino acids and fatty acids, etc. Anaplerotic reactions, these are reactions which bypass certain steps of the central metabolic pathway to replenish intermediates that have been lost due to incorporation of those compounds in biosynthesis. Organisms that lack any of the following enzymes in the various biosynthetic pathways must have the compound supplied in the medium. This is why some organisms are fastidious. In other words, what am I saying there? If you've noticed that when we start talking about special media for growing certain bacteria, etc., or why is it certain organisms have to live literally almost inside of a host cell? That's because they don't have the capability to make a lot of compounds on their own. If you grow it in a, in a petri dish, that's why you have to, have to supply a bunch of compounds that it can't make its own. And these are essential compounds necessary to produce more complex structures like proteins and uh, polysaccharides and uh, you know very specialized um, triglycerides, etc. Okay. Lipid synthesis. Lipid synthesis is basically using acetyl-CoA, which is transferred via acetyl carrier protein to a synthesis site. When the fatty acid is made to the required length, the ACP protein releases the newly synthesized molecule. Uh, glycerol is a piece of cake. It's made from dihydroxy acetone phosphate. Say that fast? No. Amino acid synthesis. Remember, there are 20 essential, 20 amino acids that can make up all sorts of different proteins. They're required, and they're made by various precursor molecules. Now, glutamate is made via incorporation of ammonium ions in the transamination process. Okay? 
But once you get past there, you have to really work at it because aromatic amino acids, remember, those have branched metabolic pathways. So therefore, if you need it, you use it. Aromatic amino acids, they have sort of like a benzene ring within them. So that could be phenylalanine, tyrosine, it could be tryptophan. They may have an indole group. So the end products, the aromatic amino acids, will act as non-competitive inhibitors on the allosteric site of the branched uh, pathway enzymes. This process allows for selective controls on the aromatic amino acid synthesis. Basically, what am I saying is, let's prevent wasteful overproduction of these things. I make them when I need them, and if I don't need them, I don't make them. And finally, we get into one last area. How do we make nucleotides? Well, remember, nucleotides are the basic building blocks for RNA and DNA. So nucleotide subunits for DNA and RNA, you have to have purines and pyrimidines, and they're made in a bunch of different pathways. Ribonucleotides are made and can be modified to become deoxy ribonucleotides. Okay? The key point I wanted you to get to understand is this, that because these systems require special steps, guess what? You can then use them as targets in certain cases for certain drugs that may eventually be your future antibiotics and things like that. Okay? Well, we're done with this chapter, and now what we're going to do is we're going to move into chapter 7. Now, chapter 7 deals with DNA to proteins. And I do encourage you again to review the glimpse, glimpse of history and review the key terms. This is extremely important because Part of this is going to help you with chapters 8 and 9 when we start talking about bacterial genetics, when we talk about mutations, when we talk about uh, how certain drugs work on interrupting protein synthesis for the bacteria, as well as biotechnology and certain biotechnology techniques. First thing you keep in mind, prokaryotes differ from eukaryotes. The DNA is not sequestered in the nucleus. DNA is still though the blueprint for bacterial or, uh, bacterial organism. Remember that DNA is made up of four nitrogen bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. They're held together by a spine of sugar, which is the deoxyribose, and the phosphates. The two strands of DNA are held together by hydrogen bonds. These are weak chemical bonds. So it means that with a little bit of energy, you can separate the two strands. Okay? Remember that the uh, chemical bonds between adenine and thymine are two hydrogen bonds, whereas cytosine and guanine three. RNA is a single-stranded nucleic acid composed of adenine, cytosine, guanine, but instead of thymine, wherever there would have been a thymine, there's going to be a uracil. Also, it has a spine of sugar and phosphates. Ribose is the sugar. This brings us to the concepts that we're going to be dealing with, and that is the central dogma of biology, which is that DNA will lead to the formation of RNA. RNA will lead to the formation of protein in the form of a string of amino acids. Then, of course, the proteins have to get uh, folded up into the, uh, to the um, secondary and tertiary shape. And if they're going to basically make clusters, okay, to make a whole low functional protein, you may have multiple subunits, and therefore you get into the quaternary, okay, where you have multiple subunits together. Now, there was one problem when you dealt with retroviruses. They can convert RNA information to DNA using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So you want to be aware of that. An uh, example of that is HIV. But there are a variety of other viruses that have been found to be retroviral. Also, gene regulation in bacteria, regulating the production of proteins, can occur by rapidly degrading the RNA molecules. And this is done by the enzyme RNase, which rapidly breaks down RNA molecules. Okay, so you see that replication, transcription, translation. I'm going to help you go through this. If you get a little bit confused, don't sweat that. But you do need to know these steps, and we're going to be moving through this very quickly. There you can see uh, the base pairing that occurs in DNA. You have a 5' prime end, a 3' prime end, because that, that's where the hydroxyl groups are, or the uh, phosphate is, attached to the 5 prime carbon or to the 3 prime carbon. Notice that basically it's in opposite direction. So the 5 prime on the right side is at the bottom. 3 primes at the top. 
five prime on the left side, three prime at the bottom. What's going on here? They're going in opposite directions, but notice that the nucleotide is consisting of the phosphate, sugar, and the nitrogen containing base. Okay? And notice that the spine is basically phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. The real key information is stored in the nitrogen containing bases of A, T, C, and G. Okay? All right. The replication of DNA requires a variety of enzymes. If you take a look at table 7.1, you need to know these. Okay, I'm going to jump around a little here, so I want you to be on top of things, okay? Now, DNA replication will occur even before the bacterial cell has completed the last stages of binary fission. That's how they uh, basically divide. DNA is synthesized one nucleot nucleotide at a time using deoxy uh, nucleotide triphosphates. So basically, uh, TTP, ATP, CTP, etc. Yeah, they all got triphosphates. The incorporation of the nucleotide, uh, the nucleotide into the new DNA strand requires hydrolyzing the high energy bond. The loop of bacterial DNA has got to unwind. When I go back to loop. Here's what I mean. Notice you see the, the replication forks. You have to separate out. And there's usually a start point that's called the origin of replication. We're going to get into that in a second. That's the site on the chromosomal loop of the bacteria where the replication first starts. You have this, de uh, this separation process. It's called denaturing or melting of the DNA. Also, the process and you can see this from genes to RNA to DNA. This is all going to be controlled. We're going to talk a little bit more about this, but let me move forward here. And what we're going to talk about for the process of, of replication is that this process is semi-conservative, meaning that there's going to be an old strand and a new strand. Oh, let me get that straight. Okay, there we are. The old strand is always going to serve as the template. If you notice there on the upper part there, the red, that's the template strand. You're going to have a, uh, an enzyme called DNA polymerase. It's going to read the information on the template and say, okay, I'm making the new template. I'm making, the, excuse me, the new strand. So wherever there was an A on the template, there's going to be a T, a thymine, on the new strand. Wherever there's a G on the template, there will be a C on the new strand. Now, if you get a little confused, I do encourage you to review some of the YouTube videos as an assistance on this, but you need to get this down. The start of synthesis requires the sh a primer short fragment of RNA, which DNA polymerase starts to add nucleotides to that fragment, and then later on it will kick out that piece of uh, RNA. A cluster of enzymes and proteins assist in the replication process and join together in a complex uh, at the replication fork called a replisome. Okay. And the process of replication for, for the DNA polymerase is from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. This occurs on the leading strand. Now, if I got that right, there we have it. There you see it right there. This is the replication fork. And you can see that whole uh, cluster of enzymes. One of them is helicase also. And helicase is absolutely essential because what it has to do is it has to separate the two strands first. Okay? Now, what about the leading strand? Well, that's easy. It's almost like Pac-Man. Walk, 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 walk. It's following down on the leading strand. But what about, what about the lagging strand? Uh, this is a little bit more difficult. Because DNA can only go 5' prime to 3', prime, the lagging strand, which is the opposite, can't have synthesis in one continuous process. Leading strand can. Therefore, other DNA polymerases will attach, and they basically synthesize, synthesize about 1,000 bases, and they hop off on the lagging strand. So you get this discontinuous sort of 1,000 strand, 1,000 strand, 1,000 strand. So how do you attach everything nice and neat? You've got this wonderful... Uh, enzyme called DNA ligase. Now these lagging strand fragments are called Okazaki fragments. They were discovered by Dr. Okazaki, obviously. And what DNA ligase is, is really sort of a molecular glue. 
Now, a couple of these terms, a couple of these enzymes we're going to deal with when we get into uh, the, the uh, bacterial genetics and into the tools for biotechnology, such as uh, DNA cloning and basically genetic engineering and things like that. And you might say to yourself, why do we need this? Well, i got news for you. A lot of the products that you use for certain drugs are made today as a result of genetic engineering. We'll get into those later on, though. Let's talk about the next step. We've talked about DNA replication. Now we're going to talk about transcription. Now, if you get fuzzy about these things, easy peasy terminology. Here it goes. Transcription is transcribing. If you've ever seen a bunch of guys sitting there writing and they're transcribing, you know, in the medieval times they didn't have copying machines. Gutenberg hadn't come in yet with his printing press. So there would literally be monks in monasteries uh, basically saving all recorded knowledge as you went into the Dark Ages. And what they would do literally is all day just get in there and handwrite the Bible or whatever books they could save, etc. Now, what you're doing here to help you is you're transcribing. You're taking information in nucleic acid format, DNA. You're going to make a copy of that information in the form of RNA, another nucleic acid. But the strand of DNA, the negative strand, that will act as a template for making the RNA. But you're going to need an enzyme, a very special one, and that's called um, RNA polymerase. It's making a polymer, but it's in the form of RNA. And the, D, the RNA sequence, remember, is going to be analogous to the plus strand of the DNA. Okay, so going back here, here's the plus, here's the minus. And if you notice, the RNA strand is very identical to the plus strand of the DNA. Why is this important? Keep your eye very closely. Wherever there was a T on the DNA, there's now a U on the RNA. Remember, RNA has A, C, G, but wherever there would have been a T, it doesn't have thymine. It has uracil. That's where the U comes in, okay? Now, you have to also remember one other thing. There's three different types of RNA. There's messenger RNA. That contains the, the message that's going to be translated into a protein later. There's tRNA, which is a smaller fragment of RNA that's made, and it is, carries the amino acid of interest to the ribosome for incorporation into the protein. Finally, there's rRNA. That's ribosomal RNA. Now, T is transfer RNA. R is ribosomal RNA. So what is ribosomal RNA? It makes up the support structure for the ribosome. Ribosomes are composed of proteins, a variety of proteins, and they also have this, this uh, structure. It's almost like a skeleton that allows the attachment of these different proteins, and it's made completely of RNA. Okay? Now, prokaryotes will have mRNA. That's what they call polycystronic which basically means um, cistron is synonymous with gene. So what basically will happen sometimes is you're going to have multiple genes on a strand of messenger RNA. Eukaryotes don't do this. In other words, all of us that have a nucleus and all of us that are more sophisticated cells, yay, don't have this. We don't have polycystronic. We have monocystronic. Now, polycystronic genes are all coded for a single biochemical pathway. This allows for coordinated gene expression, which we'll get into in a little bit. What about the process? Well, the process is pretty straightforward. You have a promoter sequence on the DNA. This is a site that says, land here, RNA polymerase. And the RNA polymerase will bind down. And the binding may be assisted by uh, several other proteins. One of them is called a sigma factor, which is part of the RNA polymerase. The promoter will orient the RNA polymerase in the direction. You don't go this way or that way. You could go just this way, one way, okay? Sort of like a directional sign. The RNA polymerase can only synthesize RNA in the direction of three prime, three prime, uh, five prime, three prime. Thank you. Elongation occurs as the RNA polymerase reads the DNA sequence, adds the nucleotides to the RNA strand. Now, before this is all completed, ribosomes may attach and begin actually synthesizing the proteins. So, in other words, what you've literally got is the possibility that as RNA polymerase is beginning to kick out this messenger RNA strand, ribosomes are jumping on to start making it. And you can see this sometimes 
Let me see. I think they have this in 716. There you have it. They're all jumping on. Okay, but let's go back before I go too, too far back, or too, too far ahead, because we still got to get into one other thing. Okay. How do we stop it? This is called termination. And this occurs when the RNA polymerase reads a termination sequence on the DNA. It says, stop, it's over. This sequence allows the RNA to form two hairpin loops at the end of the messenger RNA. The hairpin loops are important. It's kind of like, okay, that's it, I'm done. Now, translation. Oh, by the way, the orientation of the promoter dictates the direction, as I told you before about that. So literally, you can have promoter 1, promoter 2. You could actually be reading over some of the same area in a different direction and getting a different result of a sequence. But let's talk a little bit more about translation here also. And this is the components of translation in bacteria. Yes, I encourage you to get familiarized with these terms. First off, how do I tell translation from transcription? Remember, transcribe is your writing from one nucleic acid format to another, DNA to RNA. Translate is different. You're taking the language, the information in a nucleic acid form, and you're translating it into an amino acid sequence. Now, the RNA code, which was originally the DNA code, contains three nucleotide sequences called codons. They translate into one of the 20 amino acids. The codons will contain code for start and stop. This took some time. It was work that was done in the late 50s and early 60s and got uh, uh, Nyberg and a few others the Nobel Prize. Basically what they do is they take little sequences and if you notice here this is kind of a, a translation almost like a uh, Rosetta Stone. The first letter of all of the triplets of all of the codons is U, or C, or A. If you go over to the top, the second letter is either U, or C, or A, or G. And the third letter, you can see how that's all broken down, is either U, C, A, or G. So let's just take one triplet, okay? G, G, U, if you look down on the lower bottom, that's going to translate to the amino acid glycine. If I go C, C, A, and you look about dead center, or about middle, that's going to give you uh, basically the amino acid proline. Now, what's start? It's one sequence, AUG. That's it. Now, AUG will also add a methionine. If it, if it adds a methionine but it's not needed, it will get clipped off. Okay? Now, you find that interesting because you notice that you have, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, four threonine. Yeah, I got that right. And so how can you have four different codons for that? This is where we get into the concept of a degenerative code, meaning that you can have a bunch of amino acids having a redundancy of codons. In essence, it allows you for, let's take uh, threonine, for example, ACU. If you had a slight mutation and went from ACU to ACC, you're still going to get threonine. No major change in the, in, the, in the amino acid sequence, therefore no change in the function of the protein. What if you had another mutation that went from ACU to ACA? Again, threonine. No major changes. Okay? Now, the reading of the codons requires understanding of the reading frame of the code. Ooh, that's going to account for a situation later. If you don't have the proper reading of the stretch of messenger RNA nucleotides into the correct codon sequence, you could have uh, reading frame errors. That's going to be discussed a little bit later on. And we can see the code there. So let's talk about this a little bit further. We also have to deal with, uh, what's that thing? Oh yeah, transfer. Oh yeah, and we also got to go into ribosomes. Okay, let's talk about our ribosomes here. You know, get back to reading frame errors in a second. Um, ribosomes are going to be those protein synthesis organelles and for bacteria they're a little different from eukaryotes. They're two subunits 
smaller one is called 30S, a larger one is 50S, and when they put them together, they're called 70S. S is Svendenberg. It's, it's a type of sedimentation rate. Humans have 40S and a 60S, and it comes out to about, I think it's either 70, no, it's 80 or 90S, something like that. We'll get into that later when we talk about eukaryotes. Okay? The main point that you want to keep in mind is this. Ribosomes are composed of proteins and, and, and uh, ribosomal RNA. They have the two subunits. They read along mesther RNA in a 5' to 3' prime direction, and they combine the proper amino acids together. And how we're going to deal with that in a bit is we're going to show you that shortly. But what I wanted to do was go back up to here and bring up one important point. Remember I said about reading frame is all important? Well, think about this. If I just had just a simple... Uh, phrase like the red fox ate um, birds and I just moved all the letters over one I'd suddenly have this jumble of pseudo words that wouldn't make any sense take a look at the reading frame here if I had a shift in the reading frame from C-U-G to U-G-G -G, or even worse I had it where I skipped two of the first two uh, nucleotides and started off with GGC. Notice how each one of the amino acids has completely been shifted as a result of the shift in the reading frame. We're going to get more into this as a means of mutation later. Now, of course, you have your transfer RNA here. And what you have attached at one end is an amino acid. It is specific for the anticodon. What holds this thing into this very strange three-dimensional shape, remember this is a single-strand RNA, still, is a bunch of hydrogen bonds. So you've got A's going with U's and C's going with G's. Remember, A's and U's are unique for RNA. And so this transfer RNA is sort of like Igor. You know, it's, yes, Master, I bring the brain over to Dr. Frankenstein. You know, I bring all the parts to him. How do you know where it's supposed to be? Well, it's going to have a site that basically corresponds with the codon. Okay? Remember the codon is CCG here? Well, the anticodon will bind briefly, and it will bind in a complementary fashion. Remember, C's go with G's, A's go with U's, U's go with A's, and G's go with C's. So. The anticodon has got to match up exactly for the release of the amino acid. GGC is the anticodon to the codon CCG. And by the way, that corresponds with proline, the amino acid. So now that we've got an idea of things, let's look at the entire process. And you can take a peek at this on uh, the pages of uh, 188 and 189. It's a big, long drawn out figure 715. I don't want you to memorize. I want you to kind of read and relax and go through this. You have initiation. Now there's several sites inside of the ribosome. The ribosome picks up the messenger RNA and then it attaches itself together, the small uh, subunit with the large subunit. And now you've got your factory all set. So it starts reading off the information. First one it's going to read off is AUG. So you're going to have to have a tRNA coming in, bind down its anticodon to the codon AUG. And of course, that means that that transfer RNA has got to have UAC for its anticodon. And that's going to correspond with methionine. And then it's going to move over, ka-chunk. And as it does, it's going to create a peptide bond with the next neighboring tRNA that brought in an amino acid. The next amino acid, of course, has to get brought in by the tRNA to that A site. And as it gets forms the peptide bond, it makes a movement, ka-chunk, to the next, to the next uh, codon, to the next one. And the codons are very specific. So tRNA's anticodon has got to complementary bond very briefly, very quickly, but it will continue to keep doing this. And what happens is every time you add on to that new 
amino acid. You're going to form that peptide bond, and eventually you get this nice little chain of peptide uh, of, of amino acids. And eventually when you hit a stop codon, as you can see in this lower part here, AU, uh, excuse me, UAG in red, everything starts to come apart. The peptide chain is released, the last tRNA is released, the subunits come apart, the messenger RNA can come, come out, okay? So termination occurs only when the ribosome reaches the stop codon. And usually there are release factors that are proteins and they free the newly synthesized polypeptide, the ribosome falls apart. As you can see here, and by the way, notice that the ribosomes are actively jumping on the messenger RNA as it's being synthesized from RNA polymerase, which is what I was talking about earlier. So we've gone from gene expression, we've gone from DNA replication, we've gone from uh, gene expression when we have transcription, making the RNA from the DNA, and then translating that information from a nucleic acid RNA to an amino acid sequence, the protein. Okay? And that's really cool. There are some differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. This is really important when we start dealing with anti antimicrobial therapeutics. You see, prokaryotic cells, the messenger RNA is not modified or processed. So if you're familiar, uh, there's no introns, exons, etc., etc., etc. Messenger RNA is processed even before completion. In essence, when bacteria was first evolving, they had to live fast, die young, and really turn over quick. And as a result, they would sometimes be making a messenger RNA and not even have it completely synthesized yet, and there would be ribosomes jumping on it, beginning synthesis of amino acid chains. Okay? Messenger RNA is often polycystronic. In other words, there'll be multiple genes on that single strand of RNA. Once the ribosome begins, the first AUG translation of all genes on that messenger RNA will occur. Eukaryotic, messenger RNA is modified. Introns are removed. Exons are fused together. Messenger RNA cannot be processed until it is transported outside of the nucleus. Oh, that takes longer. Also, the messenger RNA is always monocystronic. Translation begins at the first AUG, and when it comes to an end, that's it. Okay? Now, that brings up a point. <laughs> I mentioned this, so I'm just going to recap this for those of you that may have forgotten it from your A and P1 days, but when we talk about introns and exons, what happens? When you have eukaryotic DNA, you tend to have some junk information or older versions in between the exons, which will be eventually that DNA uh, information that's going to be uh, translated and then transcri uh, transcribed and then translated. So what happens is you transcribe it onto a messenger RNA, and then you start clipping out this junk information, and this is called introns. When you splice together all the exons, you now have a fully functional messenger RNA. That fully functional messenger RNA will be trans, uh, basically transported out of the nucleus, so it can be translated in the cytoplasm. Okay. Um, if you have a, what they call pre-messenger RNA taken and, and, and somehow got out of the, the ribosome, got out of the nucleus, it would not get necessarily translated. And if it did, it would make a defective protein. Okay? So basically, eukaryotic DNA will contain these interrupts, introns, and basically the coding regions are called exons. You have to clip out and, and, and paste together the exons after you've clipped out the introns. I hope that that makes it clear now. Okay. And remember we talked about the screw-ups in the reading frame? Well, that's why it's very important that you know what the reading frame is doing. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of things that we need to talk about, about gene regulation. And that's where we're going to move forward on this. How do you keep from wasting a lot of material in a cell. Now, now, you have to think about this. When we talk about a bacterial cell, it's really, really, really small. 
So you're not going to want to make a lot of proteins you're not going to need, one, and you're not going to want to waste precious resources like amino acids or anything else or enzymes that you have working on stuff that you don't need. You know? And so what happens is you start taking clues not only from inside of the cell, but you take clues from outside. And some of these clues can be environmental fluctuations. And in signal transduction, the cell transmits information from the outside of the cell to the inside. OK, fine. So you transfer it from outside to inside. And there are two strategies. One is known as the two-component regulatory system. You've got a sensor, and usually that's like a protein that spans the cytoplasmic membrane. And it kind of measures outside environmental conditions. And then you've got a response regulator. The response regulator will get phosphorylated by the sensor and it will act to repress or induce, basically turn off or turn on gene expression. Okay? And you can see that this way here. And this is on uh, figure 719. Okay? Now, that's one approach. Here's another one. It's called quorum sensing. This is communication between bacteria by means of small molecules. Basically, it's a bunch of bacteria that get together. It sounds crazy. But what happens is this. They will not do certain things until there's a sufficient population of bacteria. When there is a sufficient population of bacteria, they will then turn on certain activity. And how they measure this is by the presence or concentration of small molecules. Each one of the bacteria will be able to sense whether there is an adequate quorum or number of organisms present to activate certain genes. So these are basically feedback to all the bacteria cells that are present of that particular species now. Whether they have re received a certain critical mass, a certain number of bacteria population has been achieved, and they will then be able to do certain activities. Maybe they'll make a biofilm, or maybe they'll start releasing certain toxins, maybe they will start reacting and doing something else. But one of the chemicals that's been found as a quorum sensing chemical is known as homoserine lactone. Okay? Now under natural selection, the random genetic changes in, in gene expression due to selective uh, mechanisms allow for some members of the population to survive. Some. Keep this in mind. Many times these random variations or changes in gene expression assist the organism in surviving attacks against the host immune system. When we get to host uh, pathogen interactions, and we're going to get into this a lot more in depth. But basically you've got to think about this. How do some variations occur that allow for the survival of some and not others? Well, think about antibiotic resistance. Some of these bacteria may have some of the capability. Wipe out most of the bacteria with the antibiotic. Some that are resistant, they will begin to return in the population numbers, and they'll be resistant. OK? There are a variety of other approaches. One of them is called antigenic variation. This is the alteration of bacteria surface proteins, the antigens. These surface proteins can include pili, flagella, or other outer membrane proteins. The disease organisms stay one step ahead of the immune system. Now, some bacteria, like Neisseria gonorrhoeae, have an expression locus on the chromosome that allows for shuffling of the pillin genes. What I'm saying to you is think about it this way. It's almost as if you, you went into find your car, and your car on its own turned from, let's say, red to green. You're looking for a red car. You're never going to find it. That sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? But that's what some of these organisms can do. Oh, and by the way, uh, antigenic variation doesn't just happen uh, in prokaryotes. We'll talk about how it does in certain parasitic uh, organisms of eukaryotes later on. Phase variation. This is a reversible and random alteration of expression of certain bacterial structures, such as fimbrae, by switching on or off genes that encode these structures. In short, one strategy, gene recombination, the other, random switching on and off genes, allows an organism uh, to, com to basically survive against an immune system because the immune system can never completely 
uh, compete with absolute certainty over the pathogen. Now, we get into somewhat tougher area, but not that impossible. And I know you guys will get through it. Why? Because it's just what you're going to be able to do. And this is the principles of bacteria gene regulation. Now, you have to understand this. As I said to you before, no organism survives being sloppy and making every protein possible, making every enzyme possible, and being just totally wasteful. They can't have all their genes continuously producing. They just can't. Now, some genes are continuously produced as they're absolutely essential for the survival of the organism. And, but you got to remember, too, proteins are not permanent. They will degrade over time, and some of them just get damaged and have to be removed and replaced. Also, any bacterial organism will encounter times of plenty and times of famine or hostile environmental conditions. Therefore, it's important to be able to have the capability to switch gears, change gene expression to meet the environmental or nutritional con uh, conditions at any moment. This is where we're going to start getting into the switches that we talk about. So let's talk about them. Constitutive enzymes are constantly being synthesized. The genes are always active. Inducible enzymes are not regularly produced. Synthesis is turned on under certain conditions, often involved with specific energy sources, sugars, etc. Repressible enzymes are routinely synthesized, but can be turned off by certain conditions. If excess product is available, the enzyme gene may be shut off. Hey, if I've got more than enough, why do I need to keep making enzymes to break down this product? Or why do I need to keep making uh, if there's no more um, a reagent? Okay? Or reactant, excuse me. Now we're going to talk about control mechanisms, repressors. Now you have to understand, Jacob and Minow got, in the early 60s, the Nobel Prize for this understanding. And it's kind of involved with the lac operon. But basically what they were able to see was genes being able to have control mechanisms to turn on and turn off. Okay? When we talk about global control, we're talking about the simultaneous regulation of numerous genes unrelated in function. The operon is set is a set of adjacent genes coordinated, coordinatedly controlled by a regulatory protein and transcribed as a single polysystronic message. Hmm. Now often the operon is controlled by a regulatory region next to the promoter. Okay, The region has select proteins that act to enhance or block transcription from occurring. Now keep this in mind, what we're talking about is controlling the transcription, the making of messenger RNA, and controlling whether it gets turned on or turned off. Everybody with me so far? I hope so. Repressors are regulatory proteins that block, they repress transcription. Regulation involving a repressor is called negative control. Co-repressor are special molecules that bind to the repressor, allow the repressor to bind to the operator site of the DNA. The repressor shape is altered by the binding of the co-repressor, which enhances its binding affinity to the operator site. The gene expression is blocked. And you can see how this occurs in this diagram. Okay, Repress or Transcription is blocked. You've got RNA polymerase bound to the promoter, but you've got a repressor. Normally, transcription is off. We're going to talk about inducers in a second. Inducers are special molecules which bind to the repressor, alter the shape of the repressor. The repressor does not bind to the operator site. Gene expression then occurs. So an inducer helps turn transcription on. It binds to the repressor, causes it to change conformation, basically gets out of the way. Think of it as like a big boulder uh, on a train track. Now, repression, you got the repressor, it won't attach. The co-repressor attaches to the repressor. The repressor now blocks transcription. Okay. Now we've got to also control mechanisms. Now 
The activator <laughs> is a regulatory protein that facilitates transcription. The activator binding site precedes the promoter, so it comes before the promoter. When the activator attaches to the activator binding site, RNA polymerase can move more, more effectively uh, it can basically more effectively bind to the promoter. Regulation involving an activator is called positive control. So you've seen what we talked about about negative control. Now this is positive control. It enhances uh, the binding and thereby gets things running much more smoothly, turns it on. Okay? So now that we've been talking about all of this, let's deal with the lac operon. I encourage you to review uh, the concepts and basically to also look at table 7.6 and figure 7.25 okay now this has been the important model of bacterial control of gene expression it's found in E. coli notice that you're going to have a couple of different genes there LAC Z, LAC Y, LAC A these are different genes that act in a process if there is no lactose in the cell the repressor binds to the operator and it blocks the transcription of those genes. Everybody with me so far? Lactose present in the cell. Some lactose is converted to allolactose. The allolactose will bind to the repressor, alter its shape so that it can no longer bind to the operator. Now, it doesn't bind. If glucose is not available, the operon will be transcribing. Okay, it'll be transcribed. The whole operon, okay, what did we say what the operon was? It is going to be a set of adjacent genes. So LAC-C, LAC-Y, and LAC-A are the operon. How do we control it? What you're going to find is that that whole operon plays a role in how you're going to deal with glucose and lactose. Okay, what do you mean by that? Okay. E. coli prefers glucose, but when it's low, it will use lactose. It'll switch over. Remember, glucose and lactose are both monosaccharides. Okay? When the glucose is low, the cell will turn to lactose, but a brief pause is going to occur in cell growth as the genes are going to tool up for the, the enzymes necessary for the uptake and metabolizing of lactose. I'm going to show you the two-step response grow, uh, grow, curve, and you're going to see this on page 198. It's figure 7.24. This is the dioxic growth curve. Okay? Basically, the LAP operon is polycystronic for enzymes that import and metabolize lactose. Okay? The capacity of the cell to repress lactose-degrading enzymes in the presence of glucose is called catabolite repression. CAP stands for catabolite activating protein. Now, what am I saying here? If I got glucose, I'm doing great. If I don't have glucose and I don't have any other sugar, I'll turn to uh, lactose. But I've got to have the system set up. Here, if you look at the time of incubation, is the growth curve, the number of cells. When you have glucose and lactose added at the same time, first what happens is you get this growth curve for glucose. Glucose is all used up. You see that plateauing that occurs? Now you're getting the switching over and getting ready to use lactose. Then you start using uh, lactose as your uh, growth medium. When the lactose is used up, then you plateau. This gets a little complicated, but let me just boil it down to you, okay? The inducer is removed by allolactose. You've got a particular chemical called cyclic AMP. This is an inducer. It is low when the glucose is present. It is high when the glucose is absent. The operon will force the cell to use the most easily metabolizable car uh, carbon source. So basically you shift from glucose and then you're going to shift to other sources. When the glucose supplies are absent, how do you know when you've got another uh, source? There's no glucose and you've got some lactose. Lactose will first be used and converted over to help turn on and get everything started up 
for uh, you're first going to make the cyclic AMP, and then you're going to start making the enzymes. They're going to be allowing you to use lactose. That's the bottom line there. Okay, that's all I'm going to push you on on this. It is very important, but I don't want you to get totally lost in the forest. Okay. So if you take a look at 7.6, it kind of gives you an idea about you know the levels of lactose, the levels of glucose, the the lac operon when it gets turned on, and what are the mechanisms. You got high glucose, you got high lactose, lac operon is turned off. You're going to basically use the glucose first, just like that dioxic curve I showed you earlier. When you have no more glucose and you've got lots of lactose, you're going to turn on the lac operon. And that is when you're going to use first, uh, you're going to be producing the enzymes and the proteins that are necessary to get using uh, the lactose, to metabolize the lactose. Okay? Now, we're moving from here to eukaryotic gene regulation. We're almost done. Don't get impatient. I know some of you are getting tired of it, and I encourage you, and I, I think it's great that you guys are sticking in there. First off, we have a lot more complexity here, but some of these strategies have yielded some information and have yielded some strategies, and in some cases have yielded some new biotech companies that may eventually help in treatment of certain diseases. First, there are strands of RNA that are called RNA interference. Uh, Basically, there's a cellular mechanism that targets specific messenger RNA molecules for destruction by using small RNA fragments to identify it. Uh, this is basically where uh, Czech and another scientist got a Nobel Prize for the small interfering little pieces of R RNA they found. Um, they found that there was a particular complex called RISC, which is RNA-inducing silencing complex. The RNA I will join with this multi-protein complex, which allows the RNA I fragment to complementary bind to the target RNA. So let's say you've got a target RNA that is for a gene that will allow cells to go cancerous, or it will allow, um, it, it is really an RNA that's really for a virus or something. You can take this small RNA piece that will complementary bind to it, and once it binds to it, you suddenly have this other complex that joins in. And this risk will form. It will bind uh, basically to these pieces, and basically it will destroy them. It will inhibit, and it will cut out the messenger RNA, and you have suppressed the gene expression. That's what I want you to walk away with. There are two types of RNA that are used in RAI microRNAs and short interfering RNAs. Those are also called siRNAs. They have different production modes, but they're basically about two dozen nucleotides in length. So here's what I'm trying to get you to think about. Imagine someone coming in with a uh, cancer or with some sort of disorder caused by a particular gene going off and you want to suppress that gene activity. So what you would basically do is not cut out tissue, but give small fragments of this RNA uh, that could effectively bind inside the cells where the risk system will then attach and shut down the activity. And you would be able to shut down the gene regulation. Has this been uh, fully approved yet? No, but it is in the process of being perfected and understood. Now, before we walk away, we've got a couple of other pointers that I wanted to just give you, and this includes the concept that's discussed on 201 Future Opportunities. When we talk about genomics, the advent of the Human Genome Project, basically it's allowed us to develop a lot of rapid gene analysis techniques. What you have to understand was from the time where the Human Genome Project was started, about 87, till it was kind of officially, unofficially concluded up almost at 2000. Several things happened. One, the ability to read an entire genetic map, a genome of an organism, sped up. And in that process, 
it was not just looking at human genomes. They started using other organisms. They did bacteria, they did viruses, they did uh, other types of organisms, yeast, etc. And of course, this is a spun off to even more incredible dynamic work since then. As a result, we now have diagnostics and therapeutics. We have the capability to isolate gene products from bacteria, that we can develop new protein products, such as enzymes or drugs, etc. Also, we've also been able to select bacteria genes that have certain homology, similarity in amino acids and nucleic acids, or both, to the eukaryotic gene sequences, and that provides us insights into how certain genes in eukaryotic DNA function. There is a, 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 a technology called bioinformatics, and it's the development and use of computer technology to store, retrieve, and analyze nucleotide sequence data. And you hear a lot of this. Sometimes what, what we found now is that we will analyze a gene, find it in bacteria, try to find a parallel to it in eukaryotes, or we find the gene in, let's say, a zebra fish, and find a parallel in human DNA. And by doing this, we're able to make major jumps in our knowledge of the DNA of particular genes and their function. Now you have to understand that it's just not sitting there looking at A's, T's, and C's, and G's all the time. Because to locate many genes from very long strands of base pairs of DNA, you have to look for particular sequences that are what are referred to as open reading frames. ORFs, or open reading frames, are sequences of DNA. They're generally longer than 300 base pairs. They contain a stop and a start sequence. Therefore, as you're using the computers to read this information, they'll be able to say, we have an ORF here. We have an ORF here. That suggests that there's a protein sequence there, or a gene, or maybe a gene switch. Metagenomics is an analysis uh, of total microbial genomes in an environment. Today, when we talk about the micro, uh, microbiomes, total microbial communities, we study the, the microbiome of the gut. We found a lot of different aspects there, whether it's talking about diet, whether we're talking about sickness, whether we're talking about uh, whether someone is going to be obese or thin, whether they have metabolic disorders, etc. By looking at the microbiome of the ocean, we can tell whether certain aspects of pollution or pathogens are present. The microbiome of... Um, the skin can tell us whether uh, certain pathogens are present, including things like MRSA, etc. So I want to encourage you to take a look at some of the future opportunities. Also, of course, look over the chapter summary. At this point, we will conclude for this particular um, lecture, and we'll continue with uh, lecture four next week.